What if you found out that the person you loved most was living a double life? Investigators say that's exactly what happened to Morgan McGaffrey. When detectives showed up to the scene of the crime, they were met with an incredibly grim sight. Morgan had lost her life in an incredibly violent and tragic way, and it was clear that this was a crime of passion. Police concluded that Morgan lost her life at the hands of the person she trusted most, a person who her friends and mother had warned her about time and time again, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. Clues and evidence collected from the scene painted a clear picture of a disturbed individual who wanted nothing more than to hurt the person who hurt him. But what could Morgan have possibly done to deserve something like this? Morgan McCaffrey was just 18 years old when this crime unfolded. Prior to this, Morgan had lived a relatively normal life, growing up in the Philadelphia area alongside her mother. Unfortunately, I can't find a single mention of Morgan's father in any of the write-ups I found about her case, which has led me to believe that he most likely wasn't in the picture. Regardless, Morgan's mother had more than enough love to go around, and it doesn't seem like the absence of her father really affected her too much. Morgan always did well in school, had heaps of friends who supported her, and was all around doing great. She'd grown up on the 3500 block of Oakmont Street in Mayfair, Pennsylvania. Now, Mayfair isn't a town that's very well known, but it's located just about 10 miles away from Philadelphia, so you still have access to all the modern amenities that a big city has to offer. Overall, Mayfair looks like a wonderful town. There isn't much crime, and it's known for being a working class town and an all around great place to raise a family. And that's exactly what Mrs. McGaffrey did. The summer before the crime unfolded, Morgan and her mother decided to move away from Mayfair and instead bought a home in Abington, a town that's still okay, but certainly not as clean cut as Mayfair. Around the same time, Morgan had just graduated from Nazareth Academy High School. Nazareth Academy is known for being an all-girls school that's based very firmly in the Catholic faith. They bring in students from all over the state of Pennsylvania and even have a 100% college acceptance rate, and Morgan was one of those accepted students. After she graduated from Nazareth Academy, she began applying to colleges that offered dentistry programs, and she was quickly accepted into Manor College, which is located in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, only about seven minutes away from her new home in Abington. To say things were going well for Morgan, well, that doesn't even begin to describe it. Morgan was incredibly excited about her future, but more than anything, she was excited about sharing that future with her boyfriend, Gilbert Newton III. Now, we don't know when or how Morgan and Gilbert met, especially considering that Morgan had been in an all-girls school up until this point, but we know that the two had been dating for around a year when Morgan was finally accepted into college. But unfortunately, Morgan would never get the chance to share those college memories with Gilbert, because very soon, the unthinkable happened. By the time red flags started to fly, Morgan was blindly in love with her boyfriend, Gilbert. She'd wake up every day to good morning text messages, followed by compliments on her beauty, all the typical honeymoon face stuff. When the two would hang out together, Gilbert always did his best to treat Morgan to the best meals he could afford, nights out that she'd remember for the rest of her life, all the things that most of us recall from our teenage years. Every time Gilbert performed in a sporting event, Morgan was in the front row cheering him on all the way. Morgan was fiercely dedicated to Gilbert, and she was willing to do whatever it took to make him happy. But unfortunately, the same can't be said for Gilbert. Now, we don't know much about Gilbert's background. We don't really know anything about him at all. Most of the media coverage on this case has been focused solely on Morgan, and Gilbert's story has kind of been left in the dark. All we know for sure is that Gilbert was battling some serious demons. After the first few months of dating, Gilbert's true colors began to show. What started off as the typical lovey-dovey, good morning, beautiful type stuff quickly turned into something much darker. Now, Gilbert still pulled out all the stops when it came to treating Morgan to a great night out, but each of these compliments and grand gestures were now being supplemented with hateful remarks, mean comments, and even abuse. It all started off with Gilbert getting angry when Morgan wouldn't text him back right away. It was very clear that he was insecure, but about what? Well, no one knows. Morgan started telling herself that he was just going through some things or maybe he was just having a bad day. But then the bullying escalated to name calling. 
Still, Morgan convinced herself that Gilbert was just in a bad mood. We can all say things we don't necessarily mean when we're angry. But things only got worse from here, and eventually the red flags were too much to ignore. Morgan's family quickly began to notice that Gilbert showed no interest in them whatsoever. Whenever he would show up for a family dinner or just hang out at Morgan and her mother's home, he would clam up and just sit there on his phone, completely ignoring those around him. It was obvious he didn't want to be there, and he wanted everyone else to know it. The same thing was true when the two would hang out with friends. Gilbert did everything he could to show that he didn't want to play any role in Morgan's life. He purely wanted her to be a part of his. Morgan would repeatedly brush off this behavior, putting a positive spin on it, convincing herself that he just wanted more alone time with her. Every now and then she would bring this up to him, asking why he refused to show any interest in her friends or family, but Gilbert always found a way to spin things and put the blame back onto her, telling her that she was being too dramatic or that she needed to get over it and it was nothing. This erratic and abusive behavior went on for months, but then, well, things got worse. There was one particular argument that escalated so dramatically that Gilbert threatened to hit Morgan. Now, Morgan certainly didn't think he was serious. You'd never physically attack someone that you love, right? Well, wrong. So I don't know if you agree, but for me, one of the most frustrating things that can happen is breaking your glasses, getting them scratched, or maybe even stolen. In fact, I've been through four pairs of glasses just in the last year because I always manage to scratch them right across the pupil area. This is why I've started using GlassesUSA.com, one of the largest glasses retailers in the United States. Glasses USA offers thousands of eyeglasses and sunglasses, such as Ray-Ban, Gucci, Oakley, and countless other brands. The best part is their frames start at just $39, which is up to 70% less than most other retailers. So the next time you're looking for new glasses, is it because yours got damaged or lost, or you just need an update to your prescription, I highly recommend GlassesUSA.com. It's all online, you never have to talk with anyone, and you can get your glasses super fast, way faster than some of the competing companies. I recently picked up a few new pairs of glasses for them, which are the Ray-Ban Clubmasters, which I'm wearing right now, as well as a pair of Revel Tune 2.0s and a pair of Revel Chicanes, both of which I opted to get as prescription sunglasses. If you're having trouble picking your frames, you can actually take a quiz that takes less in a minute that will help you narrow down the selection and make it way easier for you. They take things into account such as your face shape, anything you like or dislike, it just makes it super simple. They also offer some amazing tools to help you pick the perfect pair, and the most helpful of these tools for me personally was the AR Try-On. It basically scans your face and digitally places the glasses on your face so that you can clearly see what they'll look like without having to try them on in person. It's incredibly helpful. Now, the absolute best part of shopping with GlassesUSA.com is that it's a 100% risk-free experience. There's a 100% money-back guarantee, so long as you contact them within 14 days. They offer free returns on nearly every order, and you can even get free shipping. If all this wasn't enough, GlassesUSA.com is offering exclusive discounts only available for 24 hours. Just click the links in the top of the description box to get all the details. Thanks to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. There is a fine line between betrayal and your friends. Morgan learned this the hard way. Morgan was so deeply in love with Gilbert that she genuinely couldn't see straight. All of her friends rallied around her and tried their best to bring Gilbert's increasingly violent behavior to her attention, but she genuinely couldn't see it. She had no idea just how bad things had gotten. The problem was Gilbert didn't act like this all the time. There were weeks, sometimes months, when things would be great. He'd be the perfect guy who said all the right things, made all the right moves, but then all of a sudden, these demons would emerge as if from nowhere. The two would be out laughing and having a wonderful time, then all of a sudden, something would make him angry, and the threats and hate would start flying as if the two were in some sort of war zone. These threats started out empty, but before long, Gilbert turned threats into promises. By the time Morgan realized just how bad things had gotten, she'd been shoved, punched, verbally abused in ways you can't even imagine, and she'd even been bitten. Morgan just couldn't understand how Gilbert was able to do this to someone he claimed to love, someone who did nothing but support him and help him in every way she could. The thing is, Morgan had been hurt badly in the past by a breakup, and she never saw it coming, and she didn't want to inflict that level of pain on someone else, even if they really deserved it. 
It just wasn't the type of person she was. But unfortunately, by this point, her hands were tied and she had no choice but to end things with Gilbert. The problem was, after ending things, the threats, the abuse, the violence, it didn't stop. In fact, it got much, much worse. At one point, Gilbert sent a text to Morgan in which he claimed he was going to end her life and put her head on a swivel. Morgan was desperate to put an end to all of this. She tried her best to be civil and break things off peacefully, but Gilbert just wasn't going to have it. After several weeks went by, it was clear that Gilbert needed one thing, closure. He hadn't come to terms with the fact that the love of his life, well, was no longer the love of his life. He begged Morgan for something, anything, some level of closure so that the two could move on. He asked Morgan if she'd be willing to meet him in a public area where they could talk things over, smooth things out, and finally put this story to an end. Morgan hesitantly agreed, and the two decided to meet at a nearby train station to talk things over. But little did Morgan know, this talk would be her last. It was July 27th, 2020. Morgan and Gilbert had decided to meet up at the Meadowbrook train station to finally put things to rest. Now, this meetup took place roughly a month after Morgan had officially ended things with Gilbert. In fact, some sources suggest that it may have been more like two months after the two broke up. We really can't say for sure. But the two showed up at the train station at 7.30 a.m. But Gilbert had some interesting plans of trying to convince Morgan to take him back. Now, the events that unfolded at the train station have been hotly debated, and no one really knows exactly what took place there. Gilbert had proved himself to be unreliable in terms of his version of events, but according to his side of the story, before heading to the train station that day, he grabbed two kitchen knives from his mother's knife block, hid them away, and then made his way to the train station. Now, you might be thinking that this proves he had plans to harm Morgan, and that the whole thing was premeditated, but that's not at all what was about to happen here. According to Gilbert, he concocted a plan in which he would lure Morgan to the train station, then use the knives to threaten to take his own life. If Morgan tried to stop him, it proved she still cared about him. If she didn't, well, he had his answer. But this isn't at all what took place. According to investigators, the two had been speaking at the train station for around 45 minutes. The whole while, Morgan was looking for an opportunity to leave. This is proven by the fact that her car was left idling in the parking lot for the entire duration of their conversation. She likely thought it would be a quick five or ten minute goodbye, then the two would go their separate ways. But Gilbert just wasn't letting up. Morgan never intended on hurting Gilbert, not emotionally or physically, but she eventually admitted she wasn't ever going to take him back because she'd already started seeing someone else. By this point, Gilbert was furious. He began calling Morgan names, but this time she'd had enough. She walked up to him and slapped him, then spit on him. And that's when the knives came out. But Gilbert didn't use them on himself. Instead, in a fit of rage, he turned them on Morgan. A passerby actually witnessed this attack unfold and immediately called the police, who arrived at 8.15 a.m. Unfortunately, by the time they got there, there was nothing they could do. Morgan had been jabbed at least 30 times and was left lying on the concrete next to her car, which was still running in hopes of a quick getaway. But Morgan would never leave the station that day. According to the eyewitness, immediately after Gilbert took Morgan's life, he jumped into his Jeep and fled the scene. Now, in most cases like this, it often takes police weeks or even months to get to the bottom of the crime. After all, the witness that day doesn't seem to have gotten a good look at Gilbert. He merely noticed the car speeding away from the lot. But less than two hours later, police would get the breakthrough they'd hoped for. And it came from one of the most unsuspecting of places, Gilbert's own mother. See, when Gilbert fled the scene that day, it seems like he had no plans of where he was going to go or what he was going to do. So he did the only thing he knew. He ran back home to his mother to ask for help. When he showed up at the home, his clothes were stained red from head to toe. Naturally, his mother was shocked. She didn't really know what to do either. The two chatted for a while and Gilbert opened up about what he had done, though he insisted that this was never his intention. He was just blinded by rage that he simply couldn't control. Gilbert and his mother spoke for a while, but his mother knew what had to be done. At around 10 a.m. that morning, she called the police and reported her son's crime. When officers showed up, they found Gilbert calmly sitting on the couch, waiting for them to arrive. 
When they questioned him about what had taken place that day, he confessed to everything. Now, at the trial, things just got downright stupid. Now, I try to refrain from saying things like this when it comes to cases of this nature, but I've gotta be honest with you, both Gilbert and his lawyer, I don't know who they thought they were kidding. So what happened is that following Gilbert's confession, he was sent to trial to await sentencing. He never once claimed he didn't commit the crime. He only ever insisted that it wasn't premeditated. From the way I understand it, if the crime was not premeditated, he would only be sent to prison for a certain number of years. If the crime was premeditated, he'd likely be sent away for life. At trial, his lawyer did his best to convince the jury that this was merely a crime of passion, of anger, not one that had been carefully calculated over the course of the two months that Gilbert and Morgan had been broken up. His attorney spoke with the jury and openly admitted that Gilbert was, quote, an idiot, an immature kid, but not someone who would carefully plan out such a crime. He insisted to the jury Gilbert had lashed out in anger that day and that the two knives were intended to be used on himself. but. I don't buy this for one second. He asked the jury to consider the quote, mental burden this defendant was operating under. But that's when the text messages were presented to the court. Now, you may remember a moment ago, I mentioned a text that Gilbert sent in which he told Morgan he wanted to display her head on a swivel. Well, this wasn't the only text he sent that sounded like this. In fact, he sent another text and specifically said, I'm gonna stab you in the neck 57 times. When confronted about this, his lawyer simply said, he's a kid, he says a lot of things. He followed this up by claiming Gilbert was a good kid with good character. Now, in cases like this, it's not uncommon for a jury to deliberate for hours upon hours, sometimes days. But in this case, the jury spoke for just two hours before reaching a verdict. Guilty in the first degree. Gilbert didn't look anyone in the eye when his sentence was read. He just stared at the floor in silence. He was going to be put away for the rest of his life, a mandatory sentence for first degree offenses in Pennsylvania. Morgan's mother was then allowed to make a statement, which she addressed directly to Gilbert. She said, quote, this isn't just a life sentence for you. This is a life sentence you imposed on all of us. I hate you, I will always hate you, and I will never speak your name again. And I for one certainly hope that she made good on this statement and never speaks of this monster again. Though in the aftermath of this haunting tragedy, Morgan's mother, Kathleen, has done her best to use her daughter's memories in a positive way. Kathleen founded the Morgan's Light program, which she aims to bring awareness to toxic relationships and domestic violence. Kathleen travels all around the state, speaking to younger generations about the dangers of bad relationships and how quickly they can grow out of control. She shares Morgan's story, the impact that her loss had on her life, and how the situation could have been so easily avoided if Morgan would have had the knowledge and the tools to end the relationship long before she did. The thing is, Morgan's story may be over, but if you're a victim of a situation like this, your story doesn't have to be. Now, I'm not a believer in saying, break up, move on, give up and cut your losses. I believe everyone can change when given appropriate space and time, and maybe even an ultimatum. If someone wants to change, if they're willing to change, they will change but don't let yourself end up in a situation like Morgan where you continue to cling on to hope that things will get better when they so obviously won't. Get the help that you or your partner need before things derail. If you're a victim of domestic violence, there is help out there. Thanks again to glassesusa.com for sponsoring today's video. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to show your support for the channel, and also see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.